we'll just start it off. Welcome yep. everyone, uh, for everyone tuning in, listening to this. Uh, I'm Josh Presley, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Black Belt. I have my own gym in Nova Scotia, Wellington, Nova Scotia. Uh, my friend Hayden here, he has a gym uh, on the opposite side of Canada in uh, Kelowna, BC. Uh, yeah, so Hayden, why don't I, I'll just let you uh, go first. You can introduce yourself a little bit and why don't you just uh, kind of tell us, uh, you know, your story a little bit about uh, yourself and, and your gym in Kelowna. So, my, as you said, my name is Hayden Francis. Uh, I own a jiu-jitsu academy here in Kelowna, BC. Um, honestly, I've been pursuing this a very long time. This has always kind of been the, the long-term goal in pursuing jiu-jitsu is to open up my own academy one day. Uh, and finally, that, uh, that day came about a year ago. Um, but before that, we were, we were actually in North Vancouver teaching. I was teaching at Roll Academy under Philippe Matos, and I had been there for uh, about three, four years, uh, maybe five years. Been a, for a little while, for sure, but I'm from Vernon. Um, I started at, uh, a school called NOS BJJ at the time it was a Gracie Baja. Um, and yeah, just, uh, over, over the, over the years kind of made our way eventually down to Vancouver, just trying to pursue competitive jujitsu and trying to get better, you know, of course, like it's kind of, I don't know how, how the scene is over in Halifax, but where I'm from, it's a pretty small, small town, you know? And so when you're trying to compete yeah. and when you're trying to just learn, even like there just wasn't a lot of resources around especially uh 10 years ago yeah totally so yeah vancouver is just like a an obvious an obvious choice but being from vernon which is a, a town about 30 minutes away from Kelowna, it just kind of made sense to make our way back to home but trying to still find a you know a population that we could actually grow a, a good big competitive school in yeah yeah totally yeah yeah so were you already a black belt when you opened your gym Yes. Uh, I got my black belt in 2018 uh, from Fleet Matos. And honestly, it wasn't like it had all of this sort of happened over COVID, but it wasn't a plan because of COVID. It was um, the intention always was, you know, get your black belts and then eventually we'll look to open up a school. Um, at the time, you know, I, I had a really good job teaching at, at uh, Roll Academy and good people. And so I wasn't really in like a, a rush necessarily to leave and open up the school. However, the plans were starting. You know, we started looking for a space in 2019. Um, however, <laughs> obviously had no idea what was coming. <laughs> Everybody told me it was funny, actually. While we were looking in 2019, every every sign I could find and see was telling me that 2020 was going to be a horrible year to start a business. And I was like, I don't care. Screw it. We're going to do it anyways. You know, like we'll figure it out. We'll make it work. And uh, in hindsight, I'm very, very glad that uh, we didn't end up taking a space in 2020 uh, and that the space that we had in mind for 2019 didn't work out because uh, I can't imagine we would have been able to keep the ship afloat, uh, at least legally, um, with the uh, with the couple of years there that that everybody had and uh so ultimately i think it all worked out really well <laughs> feels like we got pushed back a couple of years but it worked out great yeah yeah so yeah interesting and when i so okay quick story about when hayden and i got to train together uh i was in bc this summer uh with my family for a wedding um my wife's uh, good friend and yeah, we were looking for good uh, gyms in the area. And actually, um, yeah, a friend of mine who's actually also from uh, my same area from Wellington, uh, David uh, Cusack, messaged me and said, oh, you should train with Hayden. He's my buddy. So yeah, I uh, went to Hayden's uh, academy. Uh, we had a lot of fun training together in his class. And we were talking. And, you know, I thought, yeah, his story is kind of similar to mine. COVID kind of affected things. You know, we had both gotten our black belts. For me, I also was at a at another academy. I had a pretty good thing going, a good paying, good thing. Um, but I I kind of was going towards opening my own thing, but it wasn't always my set plan. I was always like competing, training hard. It was always like the competition guy, I guess. And then COVID happened, and that kind of led me towards opening my own school because you know, like you said, things were start up, shut down. It did not seem like the best time to open up a school. But my gym where I was teaching at kept getting shut down. And I was the type that I, you know, like you said, it's going to have to happen legally or not. So I couldn't go to my gym. So that led to me getting mats. I had just moved houses and moved locations. So we got a much bigger house. We didn't even have a garage before. So, you know, one thing led to another. 
And yeah, so my circumstances is I, I actually have my academy in my uh, in my own home. It's uh, my double garage that I've converted into pretty a pretty you know nice mat space. I have like an elevated floor space. It's pretty it's pretty sweet. And we're both around the same time. We're about a year into uh, starting our academies. You know, so right now it's September twenty twenty three. I think we both started roughly like July twenty twenty two. Right. We we got the keys in July and we we opened in August. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, just talk about, uh, talk about that. Remember, like you must remember like the first couple of days and the first couple of classes, like you must, there must've been some kind of like, holy shit, am I actually doing this? Like, yeah, you know, it's funny. Cause it's like, uh, I don't want to say that it hasn't been stressful or there hasn't been pressure or doubts or anything like that. Cause of course those things are there, but I honestly, it's a lot less than I anticipated to be honest with you. Um, don't get me wrong. Like I said, there's been times where, you know, every other day, you know, you're kind of taking it day by day and like you get good news, bad news and like a lot of up and down. But at the same time, like not a lot of fear, you know, I think that's like one of the things that I think a lot of people don't want to pull the trigger on in the beginning because there's just a lot of uncertainty and that sort of thing. But for me, honestly, it's been such a it's been such a like plan my for the long such a long time that it's never really felt to me like a like this big risk or anything like that you know it's always felt like um it's supposed to be the way it's happening you know like uh and again don't get me wrong like like back in february for example february was by far the worst time that it's been since we opened that since we opened the gym you know if i'm being perfectly honest like uh I had uh, expectations that like January and February would be like busy months. And like, we still were, you know, we just concluded our first six months of having the gym open. So things are still, you know, not crazy busy, but like, or sorry, not crazy slow, sorry, (laughs) not crazy slow, but not, not as busy as I'd like them to be. And like, things seemed like they were kind of trending in a downward direction a little bit. And then um, when when the new year came around, I assumed that would be sort of a, a busy time for the gym. You know, we'd have a lot of traffic coming in and people wanting to try jujitsu and, you know, new year, new me sort of thing. Right. But it wasn't like that at all. Actually, it was very uh, ev- honestly, everything I've expected to happen in this year, it's never been correct. Anytime I think it's going to be really busy, <laughs> it's dead or we lose members. And then when it's like when I'm not putting any effort into growing the gym or like or I'm not, you know, spending money on marketing and that sort of thing. I find like that's tends to be the times we get the most students to come into the gym. It's, it's very strange. But um, in February, like I was saying, things were trending in a pretty negative way. And so we at the time weren't really hustling too much on the marketing side of things. We were kind of just word of mouth for the most part. And we did a little bit just to just to get going on like Facebook ads and that sort of thing. And um, while I think that uh, the 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 ads are, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I, if I think it's worth it or not, to be honest with you, just because of, uh, you, you get, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so then a lot of the time you end up breaking even that sort of thing. Totally. But I will say we spent about a month or two really just focused on getting people in the door, uh, more so than selling memberships. And while that definitely, uh, <laughs> it's some days made, uh, made for longer days and harder days than we wanted for no pay. It, I think benefited us in the long term because we've it got more people in the gym. And I think that's attractive to people that uh, want to actually stick around and train. You know, if you come to the gym and there's like two, three people there and, you know, it's like it's not uh, maybe what you're looking for. Or those two, three people aren't looking for the same style of training that you're wanting. It can be whether it's too intense or not intense enough. It can be kind of a hard sell, you know, but like when you have a full mat, I think that's uh, super important for new people coming in, right? Because it just gives them, it makes it feel like there's just, you know, people to train with. There's a more diverse, more diversity on the mat. And I think that, um, again, everybody kind of fits into their own niche within the community of the gym, you know? And so, yeah, it it was honestly a really big help for us in September to, uh, or sorry, not September, but in the spring to focus on just trying to get people in the door regardless of like selling membership or anything like that. And I've found that I think that that that's probably why we've been busier when we're not putting in money into our marketing is I just think we have more word of mouth happening now, which is important and good. Um, 
but yeah, uh, yeah, I, 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 it's a, it's a weird. I, I don't have a good finger on 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 it, honestly, because I swear the more effort I put into it, the harder it is, and the less effort I put into it, the easier it is. Yeah, I felt the same way sometimes when you're like really, really trying to hustle in and trying to get people in. Like, you're like, where are they? And, you know, and then other times it's just like, wow, like, you know, a bunch of people show up and I wasn't really expecting it. And yeah, when you were talking there and you talked about getting new people in the door, it kind of triggered a thought that I had. Um, yeah, when we were trained together, I did your class. One thing you're really, really good at is like directing uh, the training and like telling people what their goal is and like what you're specifically supposed to do like okay here you're doing single leg x guard i want you to knock him down to his butt because this is the reason why you want to off balance them and that'll make it easier to get the full lock like i feel like a lot of people that i have done classes with like they don't really do that they just kind of show the drill and they're just like go ahead and do it they almost kind of let people try to figure it out for themselves but that was one thing i thought you were really good at and that would be really really helpful for new people when they need the most direction I thought you were really good at like, you know, specifically kind of saying where they should be going and what they should be thinking uh, in, in the drill. And I try to kind of incorporate that more myself. I appreciate that. Thank you. I think that uh, a lot of that, you know, like right now, I think a really popular like trending topic in jujitsu is like the ecological form of training. And like, I honestly, it's just that is really the way I see it, except for, um, I don't know, like, like, I think right now it's a really big topic in jujitsu. Like, you know, the, the, I, I assume you're familiar with like the ecological form of training. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like for anybody maybe that isn't overly aware of what we're talking about here, guys, what I mean by that is like, it's a style of teaching where you're not really directing a whole lot of, like, you're not teaching techniques. You're just kind of directing people as, as far as what their intentions are, but you're not really telling them how to do it and you're letting them pe figure it out on their own. And I think that's awesome because I think that you remember it's a little more personal to you, you know, and I think that helps you re retain the information. And, and, but at the same time, I think that like, I know for me personally, like I'm, I'm not very smart. <laughs> and so like, <laughs> if, if I'm trying to figure it out, I'm not going to figure it out. Or at least if I am, it's going to take me a very long time on my own. Um, I, I, I do very well if I have somebody there to kind of explain it to me in a, in a logical sense uh, that makes sense to me, that will help me, um, retain that information as well and so like i really like the idea of trying to put people in situations where they will maybe run into problems that will provoke them to ask questions that will require technique to answer the question if that makes sense you know because i think that when you prepare a class and you're like okay hey guys this is what i'm teaching today and like this is what you need to focus on and you don't really let the, you just tell them all the information, but they haven't had the problems yet. It just kind of in one ear out the other, you know, maybe they keep one thing. Right. But like when you, when you run into a problem on the mat and like, it's your own personal problem, like, you know, you're trying to, I don't know, let's say you're trying to finish the arm bar and you just can't separate their hands, for example. Right. Like, sure. You could put the person in the round and put them in spider web, you know, and tell them to fight from that position and have them do rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds from that position. But I mean, Training that way, I think, could also take you six months to just figure out something that a good instructor could tell you in five minutes. But having the struggle first helps you retain that information. Totally. I'm really big on that, trying to create those, provoke those questions before giving the answers. Yeah, yeah, no, it's awesome. I think it's uh, that's one of the best ways to train, especially like for newer people, too. It helps yeah. them kind of figure it out more. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, I, I put out a bunch of, i would asked people if they wanted to submit any questions for us oh, yeah. on the topic of like having in a, having a jujitsu academy, having it for the first year. And I got some, uh, I got some interesting questions. So we'll just kind of go through, uh, go through some of them. Awesome. Uh, That's good. We'll, we'll both answer them. So I'll let you go first and then I'll go. So the first question that we got, I don't know if these people want to include their names or not, so I will not include them. But the okay. first question was describe your club in three words Ooh. friendly competition focused yeah nice that's awesome uh for me i would say fun technical and hard you know jiu-jitsu should be hard <laughs> what was that? hard or hard 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 yeah i like that hard. yeah i like that a lot you know i one thing i like 
always say to like students that complain in the gym a little bit sometimes, you know, like one of the, one of the, I would say, especially over the summer is like one of the hardest parts about training in our gym is we don't have air conditioning and we're in hot Kelowna. And so over the summer it can get pretty warm. And like, I tell everybody all the time, like, guys, you don't come here to be comfortable. Okay. Like, like if you're at, if your question is to somehow make this place more comfortable to be an outside of like a social comfortability, but when it comes to like the physical side of it, like you're not here for comfort, you're here to be uncomfortable. So get used to it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I like it. I like it. The next question, how do you promote, how do you promote a healthy environment or atmosphere? Mm, okay. So this one is actually a really big one that I think a lot of, uh, you, you need, again, I think a lot of people when they run their school, they also, they're doing it because they want to train, right? They want to train all the time. And then they're focused more on themselves in the training rather than the students in the training. And I think that, uh, it's super important that you have somebody in the room that is there to kind of usually the instructor, right. <laughs> that is there to like, make sure that people, are playing within the rules of whatever it is that we're doing. If it's situational sparring, you know, and then there's also got to be a, a certain level of responsibility for everybody. Like I tell everyone in the room, you need to always have the mentality of like, if you're going to hurt somebody, you should probably chill out and stop. And same thing. If you think you're going to get hurt, you should probably tap and don't, don't wait it out to see what happens. However, at the same time, while we need to all be able to trust each other, I don't trust anybody in this room and I'm always going to look after myself in the best way I can, which means I'm going to tap if I need to. I'm not going to expect you to look after me. But at the same time, we all do look after each other, you know, and I think that um, there are certain certain subjects like a really common one would be like leg locks. Okay, Like I think a lot of people think like heel hooks are a dangerous thing to train, which I completely disagree with. I think that um, heel hooks are perfectly safe to train. I think that when an instructor doctor says that because they don't actually know how to train them safely they don't understand the submission very well and i think that's very common amongst most jiu-jitsu schools um but again it's just like anything else you know you're not there to rip it off and you have to understand the mechanics of, of the submission and you have to be trying to pursue excellence in your technique not victory against your training partner yeah that's yeah. That, that's that's the big one you know we're trying we're here to uh uh Cobrina always on his Instagram posts has like a little quote or whatever, which is always improving, never proving. And that, that is the mantra for a jujitsu Academy in the training room, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And that also reminds me too, like um, when I was training with you too, I think you guys were just learning the single leg, single leg X position, but you had not learned much heel hooks. And you were definitely saying like, Hey, Josh, yeah. like, yeah, it's okay if you go for the position, but, you know, these guys have not, we have not practiced any leg locks. They're really new with it, you know, like, you know, just really catch and release. It's like, yeah, 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 no, it's cool. But that's, you know, it's stuff you need to do because if, if people don't know that and that's not explained to them, they might just, you know, you know, depend on who it is. It's a, it's a good way to prevent injury. You know, it's a, it's yeah. a good thing, good thing to do. Yeah. Another thing too, actually, as far as like keeping things safe in the mat on the mat with new people is a lot of the time I won't, uh, allow new people to do live sparring on the feet until they've actually had some instruction on the feet. Yeah, and so a lot right. of the time we'll even like start, we'll either do like positional sparring for them, just starting in a, in a closed guard position or something, or maybe you just let them start the round. Like, Hey, you're going to double leg me. This is how you do it. And then you just, we're going to start on the ground, but you're going to take me down to start, you know, and like kind of trying to ease new people into live sparring, because I think that's always, uh, there's just too many variables to control there for a brand new person on the map. Yeah, yeah, and making sure that they start out with ex an experienced person, especially for their first role, I find is uh, is very important. I, I have a question for you, even though I know this is your sure. interview. <laughs> sure, of course, yeah. Do you, do you find uh, do you find that it's like difficult to uh, when you first open the gym? I, I've always had like whenever I've been in another school before I open this, I've always been inserted into an established school already. And so when you're teaching, it's it's helpful to have like, you know, your brown belts, your purple belts, your experienced blue belts on the mat that can, you know, go work with the new guy and like, you know, look after them and not hurt them and make sure they have a good experience when they. The gym. Like when we opened the gym, we didn't do that. So the first time we first opened up the gym is that we just everything kind of falls on you if you're trying to make sure people stay safe. 
or you have to again you have just a room full of like brand new white belts like trying to break each other you know and you got to like make sure that's controlled because you don't really have you know those experienced guys on the mat to help you with all the new people and everybody's new <laughs> yeah yeah did you have that like struggle when you first opened the gym too yeah a little bit i mean i don't get quite as many new people i don't get as many big classes as you would um but yeah i do sometimes have that same struggle and that fear when it's like multiple <laughs> people showing up i'm like oh my god like that's my biggest fear is two brand new people rolling with each other because at most they've been only shown the one technique in the class so the chances of them getting hurt I feel like is very, very high. And obviously I, that's my biggest fear. I don't want anyone to get hurt, uh, in class. So yeah, one, um, one, one thing I always try to do is try to get, uh, experience people rolling with new people or I'll sometimes even kind of line up, uh, inexperienced people and I'll just roll with them for a very, very short amount of time. New people. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I like that. Line. <laughs> you know so i'd say okay i'll roll i've done it before where i'll just roll with everyone for a minute and i think it's good because it shows them they're all going to get to actually watch instead of everyone rolling at the same time they're going to get to see oh, okay this is how a more experienced person rolls they're getting to see that i'm not like physically trying really hard that it's more you know like a black belt like relaxing and like technique so i, I feel like hopefully it gives them something like you know they want to try to hopefully be like that you know um, and yeah, I feel like it's kind of a good way around like, okay, everyone just go and roll and just crossing your fingers and hoping people don't get hurt. Um, the only <laughs> thing is it can be a little bit of a grind physically, obviously, you know, to roll with multiple, uh, white belts who can sometimes be, um, yeah. uh, make unexpected movements is the biggest thing. Um, that can be a little dangerous, but, uh, I've, I've, I've had pretty good results, uh, with it. So I, I'd say that's something that I do. I'll roll with them and I'll line everybody up if it's a lot of inexperienced people. Cause I don't want brand new people rolling together. I really like that. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. And also just on promoting like a healthy environment, I would say it's a lot of the same stuff, making people feel welcome, just making people feel important. I feel like a huge thing with jujitsu, you know, people love jujitsu because it's so like, friendly and everyone you know gets along and everyone's kind of on the same level but i'm sure you've seen at other academies too where things kind of you know get kind of clicky or sometimes it feels like the instructor has certain favorites or certain people they only pay attention to or sometimes yeah. i feel like certain people kind of come and go and they don't ever get noticed sadly or like talked to but i want to i want everyone to feel like everyone is equally as important here myself included you know and i want to make Sure. Like, and I want to know all my students and, you know, be cool with them and, and all that. So that's uh, another way I would try to promote a healthy uh, environment. I like that answer too. Absolutely. You have yeah. to mandatory in my opinion, anyways. Yeah. That might what be honestly the hardest part of the job. <laughs> yeah, it can be, it can be right. It can be for sure. <laughs> Some this, days. Is another, this is another one. I'm interested to see what your answer is for this. Uh, of all the high flows, I'd ask the question. What is the thing so far that you're the most proud of with your academy? Mm. I mean, okay, so the moment went once. There's two, two, two things. What one's competition related? One's just more what we're building. Okay, so you know the the when we first opened up the gym, you know, it's like what. What I got attached to, I guess, not when I opened the gym, sorry, but when I first started jujitsu, outside of like jujitsu is fun and it's cool and I want to learn jujitsu and be capable of doing it, um, was the community. You know, when people ask me what's the best part about jujitsu, it's definitely the community and the people you meet and like just the people. The people are awesome, you know? And when we first opened up the gym, though, it's like it's not really that, right? It's kind of like, you know, you have class and people come to the class, they finish the class, they leave. And there's not really like a social element to it. It's just kind of like, yeah, they come attend the jujitsu class and they get out. But there was a, a, a shift, a point in which uh, all of a sudden there's people hanging out after class. There's people drilling after class there's people doing rounds after class there's people asking questions to me or carmen or you know there's just a social dynamic there's a little bit of you know jujitsu social club happening after class you know and like for me that's huge because we're starting to build our community right and like that's that's um 
at the end of the day, the most important thing, you know, like, again, like we're definitely aiming to be a competition focused school and we want to build a really good competitive team, both locally and internationally. Um, but at the end of the day, the day to day, every day is like the important thing beyond just one day at a tournament, you know, and uh, we're seeing that now, you know, and that that honestly is so, so big for me, like to see, I don't know, just just new relationships forming and like um, people feeling comfortable, like it's their own space, their own house, that sort of thing. I love that. But secondly, competition wise, I was very proud of uh, we had our very first uh, like turnout for a bigger tournament, not a bigger tournament, I guess, but like just a local tournament kind of thing. We uh, had a small team. We went out and competed, though, and the and the kids between the three of them managed to take second place overall for the whole tournament in the in the gi and uh and then our academy actually placed third overall for the whole tournament and i was very proud of that to to to, to uh do that a with our small team and also without even being open for a year yet so i, I was very happy with that yeah that's awesome man i love it i love it yeah for myself i would say i have two as well and I mean, because my gym is out of my home and my academy, and I'm in a small area, I'm in Wellington, Nova Scotia. Now, this is probably a 20, 25-minute drive outside of Halifax. So anyone that's coming to train with me really is seeking me out unless they've seen my Facebook ads, you know. like. <laughs> um, so I'd say anytime I have a big class, I definitely have a moment of pride because I know, like, you know, people are coming here to learn jiu-jitsu from me. And, um, yeah, as someone that just started out jujitsu as a hobby, like I didn't start out jujitsu thinking like, I'm going to, I'm going to have a school and stuff. Like I like just thought I, my goal was to try to get a black belt in something, but that was basically it. When I started jujitsu, you know, it evolved and, and all changed from there. But yeah, sometimes I, I do feel it's, it's pretty cool. And I'm sure you do too. When you have a big class, you're like, wow, this is pretty cool, man. Like I, I kind of created this and people came here and they learned from me and like, and like that that's pretty fucking awesome. You know, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy. I'm, I'm happy to teach even one person that shows up. And I feel like that's one of my trademarks. I try to have the same enthusiasm that I have like for one or two people, you know, or wicked. We'll just have like a small private lesson versus like having like 10, 20 people. I try to, you know, no matter what, I'm going to get the best out of the, the available time training. But I feel like I definitely have a lot of pride anytime I'm able to kind of like pack it up and have a full class. And then also competition wise, um, it's awesome anytime to have um, your students on the podium. And for myself, too, I didn't really think I would have so much pride competing for my own team. Like, I think that's something I didn't really anticipate where I was definitely thinking like, well, I'm not going to compete as much. I'll just focus on training. I have a kid now, you know, it's like life's so much busier. But, you know, I feel like all the competitions and wins and even losses that I do have now, it's like, well, that's myself and my own name and my own team that I'm going out and representing now. So it's 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 kind of special to me. Right. So not that it wasn't competing for other people, but it's different, different. when it's your own team. So, yeah, and it's led to me competing a lot more. I have a big competition coming up next weekend, a big no time limit uh, tournament for like a big uh, championship belt, which is going to be pretty awesome. So yeah, for me to be able to have the chance to like put that up in my own gym um, and like have that story to be able to tell my students would be pretty, pretty sweet. So yeah. Uh, Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. You yeah. I was losing you for a second there, but I think we're good. Yeah, we're good. We're good. So next question. Uh, what, I'm sure you have a few. Uh, what was an unexpected challenge that you have faced with your academy? I have a few too, but I'm sure you can think of a couple. Um, you know, it's in hindsight, I guess it sounds kind of silly to be honest with you, but like, eh, the uh, it's a nice way of putting this. <laughs> People are just very soft. People. People don't want to, people that like they need to be. <laughs> um, they need to hurt. Sorry, I'm struggling to come up with the right words here to, to make sure I don't get myself in trouble. But like, people are just kind of finicky with um, 
whether or not they actually want to do something, you know, and like people, I think, are very used to not really committing to things. And like jujitsu is just not that that thing, you know, it's uh, it's not something you do for a month. It's not something you pick up for a couple of weeks and then come back to in a couple of weeks after that. It's it's something you do on a regular basis, even if it's once a week, but it's still every week, you know, and like. It, it's like, for example, when we first opened up the gym, you know, every, any day I would do a hard session. The rest of the week, dead. <laughs> Nobody comes back. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, like, that actually really surprised me. Because I know, like, for me, that's, like, what I'm seeking, you know? Yeah. But I, I, yeah. I, and I know that's not what the average person is looking for. And, like, so that it's been um, something where, like, I, I've always really believed, though, that there's, like, there is a culture. There's, there's, a, there's room for, for that sort of style of training. And... And people do want that, but it's not everybody. It's not your average person. And like when we first opened up the gym, I kind of figured it would be, I didn't think it would be so hard to find those people, you know? And so yeah. when we first opened up the gym, I think there was a lot of uh, resistance to some of the intensity of the sessions and that sort of thing. And um, yeah, I think it just kind of rubbed some people the wrong way. But uh, if there was uh, anything good to say about it, I would say is eventually the right people did come in right and like it's it's uh the right people come in been time but to, to kind of comfortable yeah. we're supposed to be tired we're supposed to work hard yeah. we're supposed to come in like you know five days a week at least you know um which is difficult for a lot of people but we've really i feel like built a pretty good community of people that uh, um see it that way you know and um while we don't have tons and tons and tons of members of course i'd like to see the gym even busier than it currently is but at the same time it's like the people that we have are consistent and that's more important to me than the numbers you know like i think uh, um, at the end of the day i'm not doing this as like a uh, any so i think uh, something that is hard to be as much as it's not as much as they are a paying customer like we're not trying to just cater and absolutely everyone and everything we're looking for the right type of students to have in our gym that kind of meet our cultural standards you know because again we're trying to create a competitive environment and again there's going to be people there for sure there's people that uh aren't seeking that and we will for sure you know try to create an environment for them that is friendly and welcoming and they can still get good training in without sacrificing actually training competitively for the people that are actually trying to pursue that. And I think that's something that a lot of gyms have a hard time navigating. And I actually think that um, what you actually mentioned earlier about Oh, you kind of I think, think that welcoming Few that's very direct and with another person that's kind of you know on their level as well and not feel like oh my gosh we're just getting in here and we're just getting smeared into the mat you know but it yeah. took a it definitely took a little bit to get people to understand why things are the way they are if that makes sense because again we have a lot of we have a lot of rules in the gym honestly like a lot more rules i think than most gyms um but ultimately at the end of the day they are there for a reason and it's it's so that the training is better for everybody and uh when you kind of train on a cat more casually that the rules are kind of annoying i think for some people but at the end of the day our goal is to get people that come in the door good as fast as possible whether they're here to just learn or want to be a high level competitor i don't see why the training changes based on what your intention is there you know yeah yeah no i, I agree 100 percent. and you know it's because it's coming from a place of uh love really because you love so much like i do so you want people to do it but you know it's not going to stick if you only do it once every three months, you know, like yeah. that's not, you want more of a commitment and it's not just to make money. Like, yeah, you're going to have to pay to do jujitsu, but it's more because you want them to develop the skills and you want them to do it and enjoy jujitsu. Like we enjoy jujitsu. Right. So yeah, definitely had the same struggle with students where you're just like, you're just feeling like, man, just, just train more, <laughs> you know, like, like you get anyone, you know, anyone can get good at it. And a lot of people, they have a lot of good abilities 
but it, they just don't really like apply themselves. So I, I know exactly what you mean. It's just like, you want people just to, to train and do it more. A lot of people have a hard time with just for one, making the commitment and two, um, like just kind of like the physicality sometimes of the training, which that's when you really got to be careful. I find like, like that, like the experienced people and getting to roll with an experienced person, if they have a bad first experience with someone that's, it's their first time, they're going to think it's like that every single roll, you know? Oh yeah. man, I get neck broken every single round. Like that's, I'm not going to do this again. So yeah. Yeah. Like, that's actually the first Sorry. experience. Like, uh, no, just uh, like anything, your first experience definitely means a lot. So I really try to keep that in mind. What do you think about, uh, so like, okay, one thing that when I was a brown belt teaching at roll, I was really bad with, and I didn't uh, understand at the time. Do you, do you let people pair up on their own or do you pair people up? I let people pair up on their own. I used to pair people up once upon a time, a long time ago when I was first kind of starting instructing, but I just pair people up. The odd time I'll try to like, oh, maybe you should go with this person or, you know, you'd be a little bit of a better matchup body wise or, or whatever. Um, but for the most part, I just let people match up on their own. Dude, that you? was like something that I found. So I, I used to hate pairing people up. I always like, you know, you guys figure it out. It's not rocket science. Find a partner, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I found that uh, I find that like, you know, again, how you're, who your training partner is really can dictate how, how much you enjoy your training session. Right. And like, while I don't think it's required always for you know like if you got a room full of guys that are competitive and like want to train to compete and stuff you don't have to pair them up they're fine they're good to go but like for people that are you know still figuring it out or maybe unsure or they're here to learn they're not really there to be competitive and stuff even even the guys that are though i find that um if you can control the training partners a little bit a it, it gives uh a better overall training experience if you have the right training partners for them to train with, which sometimes you don't, <laughs> yeah. but also the, um, the diversity in the room. Like one thing that I think when we first opened the gym, uh, we had, a, a a couple of, a couple of guys that were training pretty consistently and they were like buddies outside of the gym and they, and like, they all kind of were training lots together and they all kind of quit together, you know? And like, which, which sucked when it happened in the gym, right? For us on the financial side of things, because it wasn't just like, you know, one membership, it was a, a bunch of memberships, right? And like, the other thing there is, I think it's important that you're trying to intermingle your students, you know? And so like, that kind of forces the social interactions with people that maybe they wouldn't have normally interacted with. Again, still controlling the safety elements of things as well and trying to, you know, find reasonable matchups still and not, you know, forcing people to go with people that they definitely shouldn't be with or that are dangerous, but... At the same time, spreading out the training with people, I think, is an important thing for um, building the community. Yeah. And and you must notice, too, if you let people pick their own matchups, it's kind of I don't know if you would call it hiding, but sometimes people will only roll with the same people, you know, and they're only, you know, they're, they're they go with the people that they're really comfortable with, which is good. But like you said. You, you go to jiu-jitsu to be uncomfortable. So sometimes you need that to roll with someone that, you know, oh, they're going to give me a hard round the next round, right? Or, you know, this isn't going to be an easy time. But if you're just picking your own rounds, you know, everyone has a tendency to just to try to go and pick a round that's going to be a little bit easier for them instead of a little bit harder sometimes, right? Totally, right? And so, like, when you're trying to, you know, get ready to compete, for example, like, I think... I'm really big on like when there's somebody, when there's, uh, when you're trying to prepare for co competition, there sh should be somebody. Same time. I think that's super important for, for being there for your competitors, right. Is like making sure that they're getting the rounds that they're supposed to be having and they're not, you're not leaving it up to them where they can, you know, hide behind their own, it's like, you know, their own fear of getting tired and that sort of thing. You just tell them who to go with. They don't have to even think about it. You know, they just go in there, do rounds. They can't hide. And again, we do a lot of situ situational training too, which uh, yeah. makes That's it hard right. to uh, rest. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. So yeah, man, this is awesome. Um, just a couple more questions on the, the gym side and then we'll just kind of wrap up with just a couple like you know kind of personal questions that are uh, more just for fun um this is one i got from a couple people 
how do you plan your curriculums? What how do you plan what you teach? Mm, so this is good. Okay. Um, honestly, like I think the uh, the biggest resource that people have that they probably don't use enough is instructionals. Um, obviously, like you know, you're doing jujitsu, you know jujitsu. Um, I think it's important that you try to create some sort of structure to the what you teach, and um, I think that a lot of instructionals will really help you with that already because they've already been presented in a in a structured manner, you know. And so I I do study a lot of instructionals. Um, basically, what we're what we're looking to do again, it comes down from a lot of like a lot of John Danaher stuff. I feel like he's a really if you look at a sport like say wrestling. You know, they've got a lot of uh, time in the sport, a lot of years coaching and developing and building athletes and and knowing what the right training methods are. Like, I don't think that uh, it's a it's an unanswered question at this point. I think that, you know, if you go to a high level wrestling environment, there's it's it's scientific on how they're going to approach your your learning. Yeah. And I think that uh, guys like John Danaher are finally starting to kind of create that in jujitsu as well. Um, I wouldn't say John's the only guy doing it, but I would say he's the, he's the best one to look at. Um, just as far as like trying to break things down into, so like what he's really big on is like first principles. And so this is how I try to always think about my, whenever I'm thinking about like trying to create drills or positions or, um, if I may be trying to create games for the, for the situational drilling and stuff, it always just comes back down to like, what is, what are the first principles, especially for um, new people, brand new people. Um, and so what I actually have is like, a, I'm, I'm actually working on trying to build a curriculum that is uh, that we'll actually use in the Academy. But right now it's just kind of like being developed as we're going through it, that sort of thing. Um, but I have like a, sort of like a flow chart, I guess you could say for each subject. And so having that as like, kind of like a cheat sheet for me, it allows me to like reflect on who's going to be in my class and kind of as much as I'm trying to follow through it as like a progression for those that are consistent at the same time, if I know like, okay, we're going to have a new person in the class that day, or um, we're going to have, a, you know, maybe somebody who hasn't been in the gym for a little while. So they haven't been there the last couple of classes. So they're going to be behind. It gives me a really easy thing to reference to be like, OK, guys, like, you know. Um, for example, like right now we're looking at like the front head. Yogi Club. Uh, does Darces take them? Looks in breaking the person down from turtle and all those things as well. But like it starts with like, can you just keep the position? This is the position. Can you maintain it? You know, and like trying to as much as we have a curriculum that I'm trying to or what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build a curriculum and uh, I use instructionals as like a, a resource for for um just basically to structure it. Basically, I find a lot of a lot of the time too, like a lot of these uh, instructionals have already been kind of presented in a structured manner as well. So that also makes things really easy. Um, the big thing that I think with the with the curriculum is like the thing I struggle with with the curriculum actually would be like developing one that actually makes sense that is simple enough but also inclusive enough to incorporate everything. Right, that's always a very difficult yeah. thing. Um, but I can't recommend instructionals enough, especially when you have uh, guys like John Danaher, just because it's like, I don't know, the way I look at it is like when I think about what should be in a curriculum, I think that uh, there's a lot of like fancy bullshit that like shouldn't be in a curriculum. <laughs> but there's a, a certain certain techniques that are super high percentage and they're used on a regular basis in competition at black belt level. And that's yeah. the stuff that we focus on. And like, I think that um, when you have resources like, say, a John Danaher, I don't. I, I think that uh, someone like that has spent the time uh, creating, basically studying himself, right, studying other athletes and that sort of thing, as and basically created his own encyclopedia in his own mind, yeah. you know. And like, I think that if there's one thing when you're trying to figure out what should you be doing, you should be looking at what's happening and working at the highest level. I'm pretty sure this guy 
do anything else besides that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. you know, I, I definitely take a, a lot of his, a lot of what he has to say um, to heart. And I know it's hard to listen to a lot of the time for a lot of people, but I, I really do think that uh, that is, that is a, a tool everyone should be using and not just him. Like there's lots of other good guys too. And I think that's also one, one of the problems is like trying to figure out who, who's worth listening to in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. I have a little bit of a unique spot, I think where like, I didn't really have, um, I think everybody, you know, when you're coming up in a gym, you have sort of like your professor and he's like person, he or she is the person you're looking to for guidance as far as what you want to learn and what you should be doing on the mat. Right. And like, I've never really had that, you know, I've had a lot of, you know, as a white belt, I did have that, of course, but I would say by blue belt, I didn't really get a lot of technical instruction in the gym I was in. And at that point, it would all be kind of fell on my own shoulders to find answers through like making trips out to Vancouver to train, going to compete, going to seminars and like the oh. internet to study positions that like my instructor at the time just didn't know, you know? Um, and so because of that early on, I really took charge of trying to figure out my own learning because they're just I, i'm from a, i was from a small town instructor was and really yeah i was interested uh, in I, I was the same way small town my instructor you know um obviously it was I, I was a white belt blue belt he gave me a lot of guidance but i was the same way he didn't have all the answers to the highly competitive situations that I was watching or looking at. So he knew what he knew and he was great at sharing that information. But yeah, a lot of times I was looking for answers that I wanted to, you know, find. And I saw it elsewhere. Like I went and trained like at uh, Ryan Hall or with other high level people. Did actually, you? Yeah. I trained with Cobrinha too for um, six weeks when I was uh blue belt. So that was amazing too. And it's like, you know, you look back at such valuable time spent i'm sure you feel that too anytime you spent with in the room with a high level person just observing them and kind of watching yeah. what they do it's just it's so valuable yeah and with the curriculums too i i follow a lot of the same stuff i look at a lot of dan Ahar. he's the best mind in jiu-jitsu whether you find him annoying or not you have to respect the amount of time that this guy yeah. into jiu-jitsu and stuff not only jiu-jitsu but every other martial art too and yeah his instructionals they are just kind of a good layout of a entire position of an entire submission i learned so much from watching his like arm lock dvd and his kimura dvd but specifically the arm lock because i always just looked at the arm lock like i don't know just an arm bar it's a submission you just go for but he has it broken down as like no it's an entire position it's a whole you know kind of situation so and then once i kind of thought about it like that then you kind of look at other positions like that too and yeah, yeah paying attention to what works at the highest level. I also like a lot of Craig Jones, you know, he's got that element where he's also kind of funny and it's entertaining, yeah. but he's competing at the highest level competition. So he's in ADCC. He's at all these huge events. So he knows what works. He knows what doesn't work. You know, he's able to present, present the information in a way that it, you're going to remember it. It's, it's, it's entertaining. Um, and then also, you know, we also, we have our own personal history, our own experience. We know what we're good at. And also, I like what you said, too, paying attention to, like, what really, really works, high-level moves that work in competition. Rear naked choke, guillotines, now heel hooks or foot locks. Like, you see all these at major competitions. So, yeah, what I, what I um, how I like to do with the curriculums is I, I think about all that stuff. And then one thing that Craig Jones said in an interview um, not too long ago that I watched, I can't remember, it was on a podcast, but he said at B Team, they split it up so they do a week of standing position, a week of uh, ground bottom and a week of ground top. And he said, you know, you're always in one of those three positions. So he said, that's how they kind of cycle through getting enough time on bottom, getting enough time on top, also incorporating the wrestling. But one thing I added in was also a week of leg locks. Cause I think leg locks are so important. Um, but then also the question came up like at the start is, well, where did new people fit in with all of that? Because if you know, if you're thinking about all this curriculum, it can be great, but sometimes it can be tough for someone that's in their very first class to jump in on like, you know, when we're just trying to start out learning heel hooks or, you know, or sometimes with like, you know, certain type of takedowns, I find like that can sometimes be intimidating for people or, or whatnot. But usually I try to think about the information and present it in a way where it's like, okay, this like a, be a beginner could learn this 
but it's also going to be like challenging enough for someone that knows it and they can kind of sharpen it up or like maybe a lot of times too, like things that I think people know, they don't know. So it's like, I'm like, Oh, grab your bicep and put your, <laughs> the back of your hand on the head. The rear neck they're like oh put the back of your hand on the head it's like it's a mind blowing <laughs> thing it's like oh yeah like i you always do that you know so it's like sometimes even just going over the basics like that's what people really really need like they don't need so much fancy stuff like they're gonna find a lot of value in stuff that you may just think like the details are like whatever right you've probably had the same experience oh my god so much man like it's actually hilarious how much uh you always like I, I don't feel like I run into this as much now just because, again, teaching all the time and stuff. But, like, man, for the lot, like, you always think people know so much more than they do. Yeah. They, oh. There we go. You, with it and kind of assume that, like, you know, people, right? And, the, like, but, like, man, I find that so often when I first started uh, teaching yeah. that I would always overplan, always, always. I'm like, oh, we could actually do the whole class <laughs> on the first technique only. <laughs> I thought we were going to breeze through this yeah, really quick. Six, <laughs> step, six steps down the road planned already. Yeah. Uh, you know, I felt the same way. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, no, that's good, man. Um, so yeah, just kind of wrapping up yeah, the last, yeah. uh, the last question I had on, uh, on gym stuff. Is the, um, oh, yeah, sorry. go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. You're just I was just going to say it. Just, just the one, the last thing I wanted to end there on the curriculum was, uh, you know, the other thing, again, this kind of goes back to like that first principles thought, um, you know, with, with what to teach, like when you have a brand new person in the gym, um, cause that's also been another thought, like since we opened up the school is like, okay, if you have a bunch of brand new people, where do you start? Yeah. I to say if there was tons of techniques that we use from like wrestling, for example, you know, you could start on the feet on the first day and show them a double leg, for example, right? But, like, I feel like the essence of jiu-jitsu is back control yeah. and guard work. Yeah. And so a lot of the time, I think that those are two really good places to start is is uh, open guard, inside position, learning how to just always put your feet back inside the knees, that sort of thing, right? And uh, and learning how to control somebody on the back, like literally starting on the back, going over the rear naked choke, yeah, just rear naked choke. The That's the best position. lesson in jujitsu. The rear naked choke. It gets a brand new person thinking, like, "Holy, I can actually do this," you know. And, and yeah. you can should feel like that. And like, it's like that magic of jujitsu where you don't necessarily get that same thing with a uh, double leg. They might think it's cool or they might get it, but it's not going to be like, "Oh man, I made that person like tap out." Right? Yeah, so, it's powerful. Feeling. Powerful, powerful. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. Last question on the gym stuff. What is something looking back that you would have done differently now, uh, knowing what you know? Okay. So I guess uh, when we opened up the gym, like we, we had it really from a financial standpoint, really, really structured to not cater to the average person, I guess you could say. Uh, in the sense that, like, you know, I, I really wanted to open up the gym and just not offer twice a week, three days a week. It's just this is the price. It's unlimited training because that's how you should approach it. Um, however, you know, it's it's a hard sell for people. And unfortunately, it's just not really the. I, we've had a lot of success with with selling memberships when we came away from that unfortunately yeah. <laughs> and so like <laughs> in hindsight i guess that that's probably been the thing that we probably should have just done right out the gate is just had that understanding that like look like a lot of the people will be happy to sign up for twice a week to just get started and then from there eventually if they want to train more and take it seriously they'll they'll do that and if they don't want to they won't and that's okay too or maybe even they want to come every week for the rest of their lives but they're only going to come twice a week and that's okay yeah. um i uh I would say that's probably, probably the big one. If we had yeah. done that right out the gate, I think we probably would have retained a few people that uh, are no longer around. Yeah, and I always had the problem where I always think of, I always think that people think about jujitsu like I think about jujitsu, and they don't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not everything to everybody. A lot of people, it's just a hobby that they just kind of enjoy doing. 
You know, they're not obsessed with it like I am. So I always used to think like that. Well, like, why, why wouldn't this person want to train five, six times a week? You know, but it's like, and like, obviously being older now too, and having a kid, having a family, um, you know, I'm in my mid thirties now, like you just think about things differently and like your time is different and you just, um, I don't know, maybe you become just a little bit more like sincere too, but you know, you just realize that people are at different stages of life. People have kids. That's a huge thing. People have challenging jobs, challenging families. Like it's just, you know, I just, you just want to appreciate when people are actually there. So I would never, ever ride someone and be like, oh man, you have to train more. You have to train more. I do. Obviously I want everyone to train as much as they can, but I feel like just coming from a place of more like kind of gratitude and just being thankful. I always try to thank people for coming for coming to class, you know, like, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for rolling. Thanks for doing it. You know, I just want people to, you know, feel valued as well. But yeah, that was a, that was a problem I always had. I always, when I was, especially when I was younger doing it, like I just thought people think about jujitsu, like I think about jujitsu, right. And and they don't. (laughs) Yeah. hundred percent. It's funny actually, like with going back to the curriculum thing, like sometimes I would like, you know, kind of tell people like what we're going on, what's coming up, you know? And then like, after class, I'm like looking at it again and I start changing things. And I'm like, oh no, this doesn't make sense. This makes more sense. I'm going to do this now. And then I come to class, like thinking people are going to like call me out on the fact that I've changed what we're doing. And like, <laughs> nobody has a clue. You know what I mean? Nobody's worried about it. Nobody's like, Hey, you said we were doing this. Like, yeah, nobody okay. remembers what I said we were doing on Monday, you know? Yeah. No, you but I always me. think there's like a responsibility to like follow through with what you said we were doing. Yeah. But you know, that's just uh. That's just for guys like us. <laughs> yeah, that's it, right? And that's just because we just love it so much. Yeah. So, yeah, man, this is this is great. Um, just wrapping up with just kind of like more a couple of like rapid fire questions, just a little bit more about your your personality and your uh, your jujitsu. Uh, same thing. Sure. I'll I'll let you answer and then I'll answer. Uh, when you were a kid, uh, who was your favorite athlete if you had one when you were a kid growing up? No. to be honest with you outside of like starting to get interested in the ufc and so if i'm gonna pick one i'm gonna go with chuck liddell chuck liddell nice he was my first <laughs> mma ufc like hero idol or whatever like, like the first person i was like holy shit this is really cool was chuck liddell like knocking people my- out he had the mohawk the shorts everything right like he was just so cool my cat's named after him. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love it. Um, yeah, he would have been one of mine too. Same. Um, give us a couple, three. Give us three of your favorite movies. Ooh, three favorite movies. That's a oh, that's a hard one for me. I'm the guy <laughs> that like you know when someone asks me like oh like I could tell you if I liked the movie. I could not tell you what happened in the movie though. <laughs> <laughs> um, but okay, I'm gonna. I'm gonna answer this anyway. So hold on. Give, I'm gonna have to. Th- I'm gonna have to dig deep on this one then. Uh, let's. Go with Jurassic Park. Okay. Old, like... old movies because I I got those ones a better. My Jurassic Park. Austin Powers two. <laughs> and... no. Okay. 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 Hold on. You remember the old Van Helsing? Yeah, I do remember. Yeah, that was that was probably like two thousand and five and also That's an honorary answer because I can't come up with a third one right now, but uh I really loved that movie when I was a child. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> I love Awesome Powers too as well. <laughs> Not even the original. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love them. <laughs> yeah, those are great. Um what uh it could be for yourself or it could be two other people. Give us your jujitsu dream match. Uh Oh. Match you'd really like to see. Uh, at this point, I'd really like to see uh, Marigali and Ryan in the in Nogi. Yeah, that would be that would be amazing. Yeah, it'll eventually happen because you know I think that's the match. Eventually, I feel like they will no longer be teammates. Whether there's a falling out or not, who knows? But I think they're not going to be teammates forever, and that likely will happen in the future. That match. I was also thinking too. I know you're a Cabrinha guy. I would love to see a return uh, Cabrinha match, even him in the next ADCC or one more match with Hafa Mendes. Mm. <laughs> I would love it. I would love it. <laughs> no, that's one thing I would have loved to have seen. This isn't a specific match, but I would love to have seen Hafa fight in an absolute division. 
Oh yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah, that'd be amazing. I think he fought in the Abu Dhabi Pro because he fought Adolfo. Yeah. Um, that one, and he's just like he can get super shitty. Oh yeah, for, but but yeah, he went. He made it the whole time with Adolfo, but I think Adolfo mounted him or something. I can't remember, but the Adolfo beat Hobrinha and he beat Hoffa in like the same week or the same weekend or something. It's crazy. See, I think I would have liked to have seen him in the gi though. Do the absolute, you know? Like, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. Hoffa, Hoffa's amazing, but like the gi, he's different level. Different level. <laughs> so I think yeah. that would have been fun to see. Yeah, he's a Jedi. He's a Jedi. Um, okay, this is an interesting one. I just added. If you could do a private lesson, a one-hour private lesson with any one of your choosing tomorrow, who would you pick, and why would you pick it? What would it be on? Probably. Uh, important, honestly. I, I really think that, and obviously at, at the level he's gotten himself at, I think for a small person, I think he's probably at the highest level. I'm trying to think if there's anyone slipping my mind right now. But uh, yeah, he, he's a... I really appreciate learning jujitsu from a small person. Like the first black belt I ever trained with that wasn't bigger than me was Kyotera. And that was such an eye opening experience for how was like, again, every black belt I trained with, still, they beat me, but they're still bigger than me. Right. And so it always kind of feels like you're just getting pinned by the big man on top of you kind of thing. Right. But like when I trained with Kyo, it was so impossible to ever have a dominant angle on him to put weight on him that it was such a eye opening thing to me on what, jiu-jitsu really is and i'd never experienced that before and i think that uh that is the, the other than kyle like the next guy that i think makes a lot of sense with mike he's you know active currently competing um i think he has a, a different unique style to him on the way he approaches uh like leg locks in contrast to say like the danaher style i think it's a little bit different another person now that it just, just just crossed my mind that we haven't heard of from in a long time, I would love to do a leg lock private with Eddie Cummins. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah, I can only imagine what you would learn. That'd be unreal. Uh, I was thinking, too, because yeah. uh, my heroes always were Hodger Gracie, Marcelo Garcia. Oh, yeah, Hodger, too. Yeah, Hodger yeah. Uh, for 100%. And yeah, Marcelo. I mean, he's such a big guy that uh, – and I actually have got to roll with Marcelo before. Uh, which was amazing, but that was just like a one-off class that I happened to be yeah. at in, at his academy. Um, but to, but to be able to get to do a, a private lesson with him, I think would be would be unreal. Yeah, that would probably be pretty pretty awesome. I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, final question, wrapping up the podcast. Um, if someone gave you a million bucks tomorrow, what's the first thing that you would do for your academy? Uh, we buy a building for sure. Hundred yeah. percent. Buy a building, uh, and probably start a second location as well. And hire yeah. people. Yeah. yeah. I would <laughs> I'd answer the exact same way. <laughs> yeah. Increase space, <laughs> increase personnel, get her going. Yeah. Get things happen. I'd like yeah. I'd like to uh yeah, like my I, I feel like I'm young enough that like if we can provided it doesn't take ten years to get this gym to a place where I'm happy with it, I think that uh having multiple schools makes a lot of sense. Um but that, there's a lot of there's a lot of hurdles to get over before we get to that point, and uh, a million bucks in the bank would definitely help with those hurdles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, now I feel the same way. Like, I just would obviously I want to continue to grow what I have, and yeah, get more people interested in jujitsu, and just and just kind of keep building on uh, on what you have. But oh but yeah, man, this was awesome. I, I forgot to add. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I kind of I kind of missed you at the end there. Uh, yeah, no, I just said just just kind of kind of continue building on what we have, continue growing everything, more space, more students, you know, just just building on all that. The the one thing I'd add as well is I would all I would create some sort of um, I love the idea of having like a fighter house kind of thing. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. not like a shit show fighter house, you know, but like <laughs> being able to like my absolute dream is to have the gym be like a place that is 
known for being like a competitive jiu-jitsu facility in Western Canada, you know? And so like one of the biggest hurdles I find for most competitors is like money, right? Money is always a problem, right? So if we were able to be big enough and busy enough to provide, you know, accommodation and, and the training and it not have to be an expense for athletes, I think that would be really cool as well. Yeah, that would be, that'd be amazing. Yeah. I would, uh, I would enjoy having one of those too, but yeah, man. Um, yeah. we got to wrap up, <laughs> but awesome, man. That was, uh, it was great to reconnect with you, Hayden, talk a little bit about our gyms. I know a lot of people were interested in, uh, you know, running a gym, how you, how everything goes on. So I think people will get a lot of, a lot of value out of this. So yeah, I think, uh, I think it was really cool and it was awesome to, to reconnect with you. So, um, who knows what will happen down the road when we'll see each other again or get to train each other with each other again, but I'm sure it'll happen uh, at some point. So, so yeah, man, I um, uh, just want to say thanks for the time and uh, hope everything continues to go well for you in Kelowna and yeah, best of luck. And I hope to see you again soon, man. Thank you so much, Josh. It's been great chatting with you as well. And uh, yeah, man, all the best in Halifax. I hope to come visit one day. Yeah, that'd be amazing, man. I love that. I love that. And I hope, hope to get back out to BC at some point as well. So yeah, take care, man. And uh, I'm sure we'll be uh, keeping in touch and uh, take care. Have a great night, man. Good luck on your match next weekend. Thanks, buddy. Take care.